Okay. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to the afternoon evening session. My name is Joran Vendin. Uh, I'm with the VACT consortium. I'm a theoretical physicist and uh, I used to be a PI uh, and now I'm a senior advisor, which gives me a lot of freedom to, to, in, to interact and advise. So um, the first speaker today is, is uh, William Hees from IC Austria. And please go ahead. Okay, I'll share my screen. So can you see it? Yeah, and it's 15 plus five, yes? All right, let's go. Yes. So uh, I'm William Hiss, uh, I work at uh, IST Austria in the group of Johannes Fink. Uh, so I would like to thank the organizers to, for giving me the opportunity to present my uh, results that are related on a microwave to optics converter operated in the quantum ground state. So why do we want microwave to optics converter? Well. Um, Imagine that you have a two-level system, a qubit, uh, coupled to a resonator. Uh, you will be able to basically entangle the qubit with a traveling bosonic field. Uh, the problem, though, is that if you want to uh, entangle this qubit with a qubit located in another fridge, uh, it's not a very good idea to extend the microwave coax coaxial cable uh, in between the two fridges if it goes through room temperature. The reason for it is that uh, the frequencies of 10 gigahertz do not satisfy uh, this condition here. In other words, the thermal uh, noise is really high compared to H bar omega. And on top of that, the cables are quite lossy. So basically, you're going through a beam state interaction to have a lot of thermal noise enter your, your, your cable. A uh, solution that seems preferable is to use optical fiber that does away higher frequency. It carries light at 1550 uh, nanometers, typically. And this is also the frequency at which we work for all the experiments I'm going to present. And uh, therefore, this condition is verified. And on top of that, the loss is up to 5,000 times smaller. Here is kilometers on the, on the denominator. So uh, such a converter that converts microwave to optics and uh, reciprocally uh, needs to satisfy a few, uh, uh, well, what is a good converter? It's a converter that has a good conversion efficiency. That is bidirectional. You need to convert microwave to optics and then optics to microwave. Uh, it needs to show small added noise and to have high bandwidth. Typically, if the time it takes for the converter to convert from microwave to optics is longer than the qubit lifetime, then you will have decay and you will not be uh, able to entangle the two parts. Uh, a design that has been successful is a design that includes a mechanical element. So the optics is coupled through the mechanics and the microwave is coupled to the mechanics too. Uh, therefore you can couple the two optics and mechanics through this, sorry, optics and microwave through this mediator. These systems have shown uh, up to 50% efficiency, but they typically suffer from a quite low bandwidth and also from uh, some significant added noise. It's due to the fact that the mechanical mediator is usually has a low resonance frequency. The approach that we uh, use is more direct. So we couple directly the microwave to the optical cavity by the means of a nonlinear crystal. So when the microwave cavity oscillates and when the field appears between the two plates of the capacitor, this field changes the index of the lithium niobate crystal. This in turn changes the resonance condition for the optics and hence the coupling. So the, the system we use uh, looks uh, like this. Uh, we basically polish a lithium niobate disk uh, that we insert in a microwave aluminum cavity. So the aluminum rims highlighted in blue will come in contact with the disc to enhance the overlap between the microwave field and the optical field. On this picture, you can see what it looks like when the cavity is actually closed. All these holes here are just made to be able to screw the two parts of the cavity uh, tightly together. We have two green lenses that we use to couple light in and out from the disc by the help of a prism. 
On the microwave side, we couple the energy in and out of the cavity through a standard microwave pin. Also, you can see this little uh, brown cylinder. This is uh, basically, basically pushed up and down in order to tune the microwave frequency. So the discs we produce, they have a thickness of typically 100 micrometer. And here you can see a disc attached on the post that is used to fabricate it. The system parameters are the following. So it's pretty high for the optical quality factor, 10 to, the, 10 to the 7. We can actually, recently we've been able to push this by a factor almost 50 to reach close, than, close to 10 to the 9. The microwave Q is more modest. Uh, although the aluminum is superconducting in our typical experiments that operate at the 10 millikilin stage of a fridge, uh, we are limited by, we think, piezoelectric effects. Uh, the single photon coupling between optics and microwave is on the order of 40 hertz, and uh, the frequencies are, I would say, typical for 1550 nanometer telecommunication and, um, and for the microwave. So now in this system, because of the Chi-2, non-linearity of the crystal, we have interaction through a standard, I would say, three-mode mixing Hamiltonian. So the three modes are the optical upper sideband mode, the optical pump mode, and the microwave mode. And typically what happens is that uh, you have a beating between the pump mode that we excite strongly and the upper sideband mode. And the beating pattern has an envelope that corresponds to the microwave mode oscillation. As you can see, the, the microwave mode oscillates one time around a round trip. The optical modes that have a frequency that is 20,000 times higher have also an M of uh, 20,000. So here, of course, I had to, for the graphics, for the picture, I had to take M to a reasonable value, otherwise it's not possible to see it uh, properly. So this is the uh, experimental setup. We basically send a laser tone in the device and we pump very strongly the central uh, pump mode. Uh, then we actually, a little part of the light, we use a single sideband modulator to shift it to the upper sideband frequency. Then the conversion happens and we collect the microwave photon and measure it with the digitizer. Reciprocally, we can send a microwave photon and collect the generated upper sideband photon. So now, if we, if we do the microwave to optics conversion, uh, we see in the optical spectrum, what do we see? We see the pump tone, it's very strong, and it's logical because we send a, a very strong pump power that is reflected and not filtered out. We see the up-converted um, photon, so it's basically our converted signal. You will notice that we see also a little part of uh, lower sideband signal. This is because if I come back to the previous slide, basically we have modes that are regularly, regularly spaced by an FSR. Uh, we choose a configuration in which the lower sideband mode is split and therefore the density of states is low, but this suppression is not perfect. Hence the, the little uh, down converted uh, signal. I'm sorry, lower sideband signal. Okay, on the optics to, so now if we send optics on the microwave side, we see the converted microwave signal, but it's sitting on top of a Laurentian shape. And this is the thermal occupation of the microwave uh, resonator because by sending this strong laser, optical laser tone, we will heat the, heat the cavity. So the conversion efficiencies that we measure uh, for powers, pump powers going from a few hundred nanowatts to one milliwatt uh, go up to 10 to the minus 2%. Uh, this is not a very high value, especially when compared to the results I showed earlier with a mechanical oscillator that uh, reach 50%. But what's pretty promising is that the added noise, uh, which is basically this value here at the frequency of conversion, so the peak in this Laurentian, this added noise is pretty low. And typically for added noise of one photon, we have a conversion efficiency of uh, 10 to the minus five. 
at the moment we, we published these results, this was seven orders of magnitude higher than the, the, the previous best. So can we push this further? Can we get an even better ratio of conversion efficiency over uh, added noise? And it seems this is possible with uh, pulsing. So this graph shows basically the added noise photons as a function of time. When we send a pulse in between the two dashed lines of uh, 1.4 milliwatts of power. What we can see is that the system reacts pretty, the noise, the, the thermal noise of the system reacts pretty slowly to the uh, turning on of the optical pulse. And we have one photon per second rising. And actually it takes a few minutes to decay. So one could expect that if we send very intense pulses of light, we will beneficiate for the very strong enhanced uh, three mode mixing interaction before we, uh, before we hit uh, the system. So we do it. So now we use uh, an EDFA, an optical amplifier, to basically send very strong pulses, one watt. Uh, they are pretty short, 300 nanoseconds, and are sent every two milliseconds. So when we send a pulse, we now uh, measure a conversion efficiency of 15%, which is logical, it's a, it's a thousand times higher. And uh, the pump that we use is a, is a, is a thousand times stronger. Uh, we also notice that uh, we have an overshoot, which is due to the, due to the preloading of the cavity. And it's an effect that can be completely used. Uh, so the red points correspond to the value of conversion with this other shoot, other shoot and the blue points uh, without. Now about the noise. Um, since the system is extremely slow to respond to the thermally to the optical pulse, we see that the noise is not stationary, is not moving. But the dip that you see that corresponds to when we send the pulse, which is the blue region, uh, is actually some uh, sideband cooling. So an effect that shows at uh, cooperativities that are close to one. So this is actually the first time, uh, to my knowledge, that uh, people observe some sideband cooling directly of a microwave mode through an optical tone. So because basically this is the, the first time that uh, an electro-optic system approaches a cooperativity of, uh, of one. So now, uh, as we decrease the trigger rate, uh, the average power diminishes, but the peak pump power stays the same in this graph. And we see that the average thermal occupancy goes down. If we push this trigger rate to very low values, we can have an added thermal noise that is significantly smaller than one. And uh, therefore, if we define the uh, added noise referenced at the input, which is equal to the output added noise divided by the conversion efficiency eta, uh, we see that we can get uh, below one. So this is not an absolute first. Uh, people in a painter, Oscar Painter group, uh, have seen uh, similar uh, figures, but uh, though we work at a significantly higher conversion efficiency. Okay. Um, so in these uh, experiments, we try to, to do up uh, conversion and therefore we do some sideband cooling, but uh, we can also enhance some conversion and do some uh, two more squeezing. And since we work at cooperativities close to one, uh, theory predicts that we should start to see uh, two more squeezing and therefore entanglement between the optical and the microwave uh, subsystems. So this time what we do is that we don't need to create uh, some uh, signal to be converted. We just pump the system very strongly and we invert uh, the spectrum so that now the upper sideband mode is split and the lower sideband mode is full. Therefore the down conversion process is uh, enhanced. So yes, this creates two, maybe I should, say uh, this creates two photons, one uh, optical and one microwave photons, and we measure the quadratures uh, of these two photons and, and seek for, uh, look for correlations. So the following histogram is, uh, shows the X quadrature in the microwave system versus the uh, P quadrature of the, of the optical system. And if you look very attentively, 
you will see that there is an ellipse. It's a video. There's an ellipse that forms along the plus 45 and uh, minus 45 uh, degrees axis. It's a faint effect, but it basically corresponds to correlations uh, between these two quadratures of the two subsystems. We can uh, therefore calculate the coefficients of the density matrix. The diagonal coefficients corresponds to the occupancies in the respective modes, microwave and uh, optics. But these two red off diagonal coefficients correspond to the correlation. Uh, for the moment, they are quite uh, small. Uh, we haven't tried to really quantify uh, the entanglements between these two subparts for now. Uh, but we will soon, I think, apply the Duran criterion, for instance, and, and, and see what we have. But uh, I should mention that we have also expectations to improve um, this, uh, these experiments by basically having a system with higher quality factor or by enhancing the collection uh, to the, of the optical parts and microwave parts. Okay, uh, I would like to thank my team for the outstanding scientific environment uh, they provided. And uh, more specifically, uh, Alfredo Rueda, uh, Georg Arnold, Richard Shahu, and uh, of course the boss, uh, Johannes, uh, that have been uh, uh, participating more specifically in this uh, project. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, the talk is open for questions. I see nothing in the chat yet. So, um, so, at what a short question? What sort of uh, conversion efficiency do you need in order to start actually, uh, let's say, entangling to uh, or communicating between two um, computers for distributed computing or something like that? Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm. Well, one experiment you could think of is that you could basically uh, try to come back to the to the first slide. So you could have the qubit plus resonator uh, send, for instance, a, a single photon train uh, of, of light, and then you could um, you could convert it to optics, and then you could basically measure the the G two, for instance, of this uh, train of photons and see if if it's indeed single photon train and. Uh, I assume that it's about it's always about noise and conversion together, right? I mean, uh, if your if your conversion is not sufficient, then you will start to add too much noise, and therefore this single photon train will be stained, let's say, with too much thermal noise. So, um, if I really need to give you a number, um, I would say, um, well, it's it's difficult to say. Um, I'm uh, sure, yes, uh, but I, I would guess that you are planning things like that yourselves in uh, in your labs. You mean if we if we if we want to try this experiment with actually the to problem, communicate yeah. and for the, uh, I mean this is of course the beginning of distributed processing and so on. So yes, I mean we we are not. We, we are currently we are not uh, trying to really entangle two qubits in different fridges. We are more characterizing the, the converter, right? Um, yeah. The single single photon train experiment. We want to. It's it's something that we want to try. Um, so it's yeah. uh, it, it is planned. Uh, but directly entangling two qubits, we uh, we have not uh, tried it for now. No, I can imagine. <laughs> um, I see two uh, questions at least. Uh, Dear Luo, would you like to start? Hi, thank you very much for the for the talk. It's great. And um, let me ask, can I ask, like, uh, what's the distance between the electrodes and to the surface of the disk, and what's the thickness of your disk? Okay, uh, so the lithium ion yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the thickness, the the lithium ion disk that you see here is typically a hundred micron thick. Um, in the experiment, we really try to have the cavity coming in direct contact with the disk. And therefore, the distance of between the two electrodes is very close, we believe, to 100 microns. So, uh, but, uh, um, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, the, this distance for the moment is um, is that much. Um, we could try to make it make the disk even thinner, and therefore we would enhance the interaction between the uh, the microwave and the optics. 
uh, but it also comes with additional difficulties and it's, it's difficult to keep a very high Q disk uh, if we really uh, thin down this disk uh, very much. Yeah, actually that's my question. So if, actually that's my second question. Uh, so if it's, so just want to ask you like, um, how, how does your Q degrade with uh, like, a, did you calculate the trade-off say between, so you can imagine that as you like, a, uh, making the disk more um, electrons more closer, you get an uh, adequate loss. So, is there any like a theoretical limit to that? Like you can act, you can actually you gain interaction, but you but you lost the uh, um, sorry, you also lost your Q. So, yes. is there like uh, something that you can fundamentally you can't break? Okay, so so first, yeah, uh, lapping the disk, uh, thinning down the disk to extremely small values is just technically difficult. But even if we could do it, uh, we have not really studied this. Uh, uh, completely theoretically, but I believe that uh, the proximity of the metal very close to the optical mode will then also result in some uh, losses. So yeah, uh, eventually we would just uh, see the, the strong imaginary part in the, uh, in the optical index of the metal and uh, therefore the, 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 the losses would be too high. Yeah, okay, okay. thanks. Um Thank you. Uh, Sandoko, you have a question? Yes, Yaron. Hi, William. Thank you so much for uh, this very interesting talk. So I have three questions that I'm going to cheat. I'm going to combine them to one question. So I wonder whether it's possible to consider trying to do free space transmission within the fridge. Uh, and I wonder whether they will maybe heat up your fridge. Perhaps it will. And number two is that uh, if you think about like uh, the loss within your system, why is the coupling efficiency uh, between like I mean, between your crystal and your fiber, is it going to like kill your experiment in the long run? Because I guess if you don't couple it very well, then this might be even worse than your uh, 0.2 dB per meter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I forgot the third question, but I think it's two questions. Uh, yeah, hey, I'll, try, I'll try first to answer the two questions. <laughs> um, so about free space coupling, um, we believe that the essential of the heating happens inside the disk. So uh, we use fibers, yes, to, to basically get into the fridge and, uh, and couple to our system. So these this, this parts here are, are really fibers, but um, if we would use free space, uh, I think it would not make much of a difference. The, the energy is really, we believe, dissipated inside the lithium ion uh, resonator. Does this answer your question? Uh, so, okay, so the loss within the lithium ion is much larger than this 0 0.2 dB times like how? How many yes, times? yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Okay. We believe that we 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 don't hit the we don't heat the fridge because of the propagation of light in the fibers. Okay. About so your second question, yes, okay. the 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 coupling in and out of the resonator is uh, is not uh, extremely high. Typically, the ratio between the internal losses uh, of the resonator and the external uh, coupling is on the order of uh, one. So basically, we are close to critical critical coupling. So for every photon that we couple out, we actually also lose one in the, in the resonator. So obviously this limits the conversion efficiency. Uh, mm -hmm. and this limits also the amount of squeezing that we could see in the TMS experiment. And we will try to, to basically uh, enhance this external coupling. But how do you actually tune this coupling? Because I guess when you cool them down, would there be like some kind of a displacement of this fiber? Yes, so yes. Uh, basically we, we wrote a script when the fridge is cooling down, uh, we basically uh, look at the modes live and we basically track them to not lose them during the cool down. Otherwise, these, these, these modes, we would definitely... Uh, what do you tune, them. actually? Sorry, I don't get it. What, what do you tune to adjust this coupling? To adjust the coupling, we tune the position of the prism ah, okay. with respect. So basically, you see that the prism is attached to a rod. Yes. Okay? It's not shown here, but the rod is attached to a piezo positioner. And we can basically push it towards the disc or, or away from the disc. And this allows to tune the optical coupling. Interesting. Thank you so much for the answer. Great work. Lucas, do you have a quick question? I do. I do have a quick question. Uh, okay. My question is, what sets the bandwidth for this converter? You said the optomechanical systems have pretty low um, bandwidths. Is it the Q of your aluminum cavity or what sets Oh, the yes, yes. Very good. Very good remark. I, I forgot to mention this. So basically the, the bandwidth of this converter is limited essentially by the line width of the microwave subsystem. The, the line width of the optical subsystem is even higher. 
So basically, you can see in these insets that uh, we measure the bandwidth to be on the order of 20 megahertz and therefore compatible with the typical lifetimes of uh, current superconducting qubits. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very nice talk. Okay, so if you could, uh, yes, great. So Sabrina, could you, uh, perhaps could you? Uh, yes. Put up your slides. So you'll talk about optimal control of high dimensional Hilbert space. Exactly. So I, th I assume you can hear me and see my screen? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, great. So uh, I'm Sabrina. I'm from the group of Christiane Koch at the Free University in Berlin. And today I'm going to present a work which is a collaborative work together with experimentalists from the Collège de France in Paris. And I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present our work here. So we are at a workshop on enabling technologies and algorithms for quantum computing. And one prerequisite for all kinds of quantum technologies is the precise control over your quantum system. And you might even go one step further and say that it is controlled to turn scientific knowledge into technology. And I myself am particularly interested in the engineering of, um, of quantum states as we need them for all kinds of quantum technologies. And you might say that uh, while in the first quantum revolution, it was all about enjoying the company of Schrodinger's cat, in the second quantum revolution, we actually want to train it. And the method I'm using for training Schrodinger's cat is quantum optimal control. So quantum control in general is the process of manipulating dynamical processes at the atomic or molecular scale. And typically we're using external electromagnetic fields for this. And quantum optimal control essentially wants to do the same thing, but in the best way possible. That could mean either as fast as possible or with the highest fidelity as possible. And quantum optimal control started in the 1980s in the field of atomic and molecular physics, where the interest lay in um, especially in the control of chemical reactions, such as the dissociation of molecules. Um, the second field where optimal control is very popular is NMR, which has already reached commercial applications and where current research interests lie in the field of um, spin cooling and um, engineering of quantum sensors. And uh, that keyword already brings us to the third area, which is quantum technologies, which I hardly need to motivate here. And uh, here you see a picture of my own research, which I'm going to present to you in the following. So a short outline. First, I want to give you a quick introduction to quantum optimal control theory. And then I want to present two different applications, where in one example, we want to improve an existing protocol. And in another one, we want to prepare states that cannot be prepared, uh, created with standard, um, standard protocols. And um, as you can see from um, the, the titles here, um, my examples come from slightly different fields than the focus of this conference, namely from Rupert Adams and quantum sensing. But nevertheless, I think that that might be interesting to many um, of you because I will also talk about in general how we can use optimal control in real physical systems and for real experiments. So let's dive right in. Um, if you want to optimize something, you first have to formulate what you actually want to optimize. And the thing that I'm interested in is a state-to-state -state optimization. And here we want that our final state at some time capital T is equal to a target state that we chose beforehand. And the final state is the result of a time propagation using a control field starting from some initial state. And then we can also put that into slightly more mathematical terms. Uh, and define a functional J of capital T to quantify the mismatch between the target state and the final state. And if you want to optimize something else, you can also change the functional, for instance, for gate optimization or for creations of perfect entanglers or whatever you want to do. And then we want to minimize the functional using variation in calculus. But in most cases, there's no analytical solution to this problem. So we want to update the control fields in an iterative scheme. That means that we start with a guess pulse, we see how it performs, and then we update this guess pulse step by step until we reach the target state with a desired fidelity. And um, to understand um, this a bit better, how the pulse update works, we can actually imagine our optimization as a landscape. So here the functional takes a different value as a function of the control parameter. And then we can imagine if we start at some point here, we can calculate the gradient and then just walk downhill until we find the minimum of our landscape. And this is called a gradient-based um, optimization. 
and then how this gradient information is translated into the pulse update depends on the specific algorithm that you're using. And the algorithm that we are using is Crotos method, which guarantees a monotonic convergence of the functional. And if you're interested in the details of Crotos method, you can um, check out this paper here, which also gives a ready to use implementation of Crotos method using Qtip. So you might think now that um, once we have implemented the algorithm, it's just pressing a button and waiting for the result. But it's not quite as easy as that because um, optimal control and also Crotos method are mathematical algorithms. That means that the updated pulse might be very complicated and not feasible in a real experiment. And what we do here is um, we have to take the experimental limitations already into account during the optimization. And that could be bandwidth or field strength limitation or um, the step size of an arbitrary waveform generator. So let's look at a specific example. And here, as I already said, we want to improve an existing protocol, which is the circularization of ripback atoms. So in case you're not familiar with ripback atoms, um, don't worry too much, because ripback atoms are essentially just highly excited hydrogen atoms. And the advantages of ripback atoms are that they have a very long lifetime and that they are very sensitive to electric and magnetic fields. And you might remember that each energy level of hydrogen actually has an n squared degeneracy. But if we employ a static electric field, this degeneracy is lifted. And here we see a sketch of the so-called Stark manifold of how the energy levels in hydrogen split up for one principal quantum number n. But in Rupert physics, we usually don't use hydrogen, but alkali atoms, for instance, rubidium, which in addition to the valence electron also have an ionic core where there's more electrons inside. Due to the influence of this ionic core to the valence electron, the Stark manifold looks a slightly bit different. So the state that we want to prepare is the so-called circular state, which can be found here at the edge of the Stark manifold, and um, which has the properties that the angular and the magnetic quantum number take their maximal value. And the circular state has its name from the circular state, um, the circular shape of the electronic orbital. And they're very popular, for instance, in quantum sensing, but also in quantum computing and cavity QED. And then usually we don't start in the circular state, but in this initial state here, which is the low state of the M equal two uh, ladder. And this state can be prepared using optical, optical excitations. And then the question is, how do we bring our population from the initial towards the target state? And there are already protocols for that. And one of them is we simply employ a radio frequency pulse, which is resonant to the transitions on this lowest diagonal ladder here. And um, as you can see, the dynamics are then very confined to this lowest diagonal ladder, and therefore we can simply throw out all the rest. And um, in this case, we are left with an n-level system, which you can also interpret as a large spin system. And as a spin system, we can now visualize the dynamics on a Bloch sphere. And then the target state simply becomes the north floor of the Bloch sphere. And here you see the Q function, and we don't have a point, but we have this Gaussian shape of the state, which we call a spin coherent state. And the initial state is then, well, not the south pole, but a ring around the south pole, because we don't start in m equal zero, but in m equal two. And then first, what we do is we look at the performance of the gas pulse. And this is what you see here. So we have the RF pulse. And since this is circularly polarized, we have an X and a Y component. And here are some snapshots of the Bloch sphere. And indeed, the population is excited toward the north pole but the shape of the state is a bit wrong. So we don't have this Gaussian perfect spin coherent um, state shape, but it's slightly deformed. And the reason for that is that um, since we deal with rubidium, this N-level system is not completely harmonic, but we lose some population to the left side here. But this we can now fix using optimal control theory. And here you see already the optimized pulse. And now this pulse leads to fidelity of 99%, so just if you haven't seen it, so before it was 79%. And we see that most of the changes happen in the first 40 nanoseconds of the pulse. And we can explain this by looking again at the Bloch sphere. And here at the uh, first 40 nanoseconds, we already see the shape of the spin coherent state at 40 nanoseconds. And then afterwards, this spin coherent state can simply be rotated towards the North Pole with a very easy flat shape of the pulse here. So that's really great. And from a theoretical point of view, we're done. But the problem is uh, we have to think of our experimental friends. And if you look here in the background, you see this vertical dashed lines. Those are is the step size of the AWG. 
if you tried to implement this pulse directly, it wouldn't work. So we do two different things. First, we remove, this, we remove the central frequency, and then we're left with two cruddages of the field. And those are just a circularly polarized pulse and another one with a phase shift of pi over two. And you can interpret this as rotations around the x and the y axis of the block sphere. And this is already much better, but we can simplify this even a bit more because I said that after 40 seconds, nothing really happens but a rotation um, towards the North Pole. So we can simply flatten this part out here. And indeed, these oscillations are merely a result from a um, restriction of the spectrum in, during the optimization. So this is just a Fourier remaining. And if we now use this pulse to implement it in the experiment, um, we actually reach the circular state also in the experiment with a fidelity of 96.2%. So here you see really um, the dynamics, so the evolution of the states as a function of time. And here the yellow one is the initial state and the green one is the target state. And to put this a bit into perspective, um, the pi pulse, which was essentially our gas pulse, has a fidelity of only 80%. And there's another method to prepare circular states, which has a very high fidelity, but it takes very long since it is an adiabatic message, a method. And with optimal control, we could uh, get the best of both worlds. So we can perform the circularization fast and accurate. So in this protocol, we saw that we can improve something that we can do already using optimal control. But now we want to go one step further and prepare a state for um, which no protocol was previously known. And this example comes from quantum sensing. So in quantum sensing, we want to measure some quantity with a higher fidelity than we could with any classical sensor. And in our case, this is the static electric field. And in principle, you can um, separate each protocol in three different steps. One is you um, prepare a state which is very sensitive to the quantity you want to measure. Then you let the system evolve freely under the influence of this quantity. And then you perform a readout. And um, Ripper atoms have already been used by our experimental collaborators for an electrometer um, setting. But we wanted to improve this, this experiment. And for this, we tackled the first step of the preparation. So we ask ourselves the question, which state do we have to prepare to be very sensitive to electric fields? And for this, we can look again at this dark manifold. Now in the background, you can see with this color gradient how sensitive the states are to the DC field. And from this, we can now conclude that this green state here would be a very good sensor state, because on the one hand, we have the M equal one state, which is very sensitive to the electric field. And on the other hand, we have the circular state, which is completely insensitive to the electric field. And the circular state then in, serves as kind of a reference state to have a phase reference to measure the electric field. And the question is, how do we prepare the state from our initial state? And um, again, we started with the plain RF pulse and optimized it. And the result is shown here. And here we already see the two creditors. And they are indeed um, quite different from the circularization that we, that we saw before, but by looking at the evolution of the population as a function of time, we can actually deduce what is happening. So again, the first part is, has a um, stronger modulation. And here we see that in the first 50 nanoseconds, we do um, two things. So on the one hand, we have a lot of population in M equal one and M equal two. And um, indeed this mixture here is an eigenstate of the time-dependent Hamiltonian. So that means that this is a dark state and it's not going to be affected by the pulse afterwards at all. And then the other part is a spin coherent state. And this we can rotate towards the north pole of the block sphere again, very similar to the circularization. And since the other part is the dark state, it's not going to be affected. And then all we have to do in the end is to switch off the pulse slowly so that this mixture of state becomes the M equal one state adiabatically. And um, this we have also done in the um, experiment. And um, we again flattened the pulse a little bit to make it a bit easier. And then we see that it actually works very well. So here the red one is the M equal one and the um, green one is the circular state. And we reached both states with a fidelity of about 48%. And with this, I'm already at the end and I want to give you a short summary. Uh, in the format of a checklist for optimal control of high dimensional Hilbert spaces. So the first thing we were doing is we wanted to reduce the size of the Hilbert space as much as possible in order to speed up the optimization process. 
And then you should always start with a smart guest pulse, such that you already bring some population in towards your target state, and it should also not be too long or too short. And then in order to have experimentally feasible pulses, you should um, also take the experimental limitations already into the, um, during the optimization into account. And then the last two steps is kind of a plus because if you interpret, uh, interpret the optimized pulses to get a physical insight, you can simplify the pulses in order to make them even better in the experiment. So for the circularization, we flattened the pulse out and in this um, creation of the um, superposition, we did a very similar thing. And um, yes, so this was already everything I wanted to present you. So if you're uh, interested in the details, feel free to check out our papers. And now I'm open to your questions and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we have a quest. Well, uh, that was a hand clapping. No, no. Um, <laughs> while I wait for, for people to uh, gear up a question, sort of, uh, uh, are you are you basically uh, doing this within the group over yourself for sensing, or, or do you have any sort of information processing uh, in mind? So um, in the group here, we were doing this for sensing. So our ultimate goal really was to create this superposition in order to use it for sensing. But um, so the experimental group um, themselves, they also have an idea for quantum simulation where they also need circular states where they could think of using this fast circularization protocol um, in their, their simulator setup. Yeah. Because in, in a way, I want to say, uh, it seems you, your, your work is really in the tradition of the original work of, of, uh, of chemistry, really to, to, to massage wave functions in very exquisite ways, right? Yes, definitely. So, so it's a really good tradition. Yeah. Uh, are there any questions? Mm, okay, so hi, Olaf here. So I could ask yes, a question. Ahead, so please. you have this uh, sure. checklist. So for the, for the last step, you sort of see some, uh, you looked at the pulse and you had some insight and you simplified it. Yes. Uh, do you, could you sort of achieve the same effect in the third step? No, sorry, the uh, yeah third step uh, by modifying your objective function, or you prefer to do this sort of massaging or polishing on your own? Um, so we did actually two things. So already during the optimization, um, we, we made some modifications to the pulse. So for instance, we had a shape function, which um, led to smooth switching in, uh, switching on and off of the pulse. So this already gives a um, better experimental shape of the, of the pulse. And then for instance, the, um, Amplitude was limited also already in the, not really in the functional, we, but we had like an additional constraint in the functional um, to, to limit um, the amplitude and the spectrum of the pulse. And then this was already like the, if you see here the solid lines, those were results already um, with constraints on this, this properties. And then the additional step was just to make it even easier in the experiment and to have some, come, some kind of tunability in the experiment still. Okay, yeah, thank you. So I see no hands. Um, are there any uh, questions that you would like to ask directly? Well, if not, uh, thank you very much for a very nice talk. And uh, mm, wasn't there a hand by Son? You saw a hand? Yes, I think it was me. Oh, there is one, Son also. Okay. okay. Thank you for <laughs> supporting. I have a last minute question, but this is just a basic question. So when we talk about um, the transition between the theoretical optimized uh, pulse to the experimentally uh, made pulse, I guess uh, that happens because you have to discretize the pulse. So I wonder whether when you discretize the pulse with such a low frequency, would that, for instance, like if you have a 600 megahertz and you sample it at like, you know, uh, 1.2 gigahertz, uh, how would that affect the spectral content of your experimental pulse? Like if you change the sampling frequency of your... Mm, yeah, so it's so the fidelity in the experiment partly depends on the sampling, but it also depends just on a lot of um, filters that happen in the experiment themselves. For instance, we saw that very low frequencies were very hard to generate just because um, of reflection and of um, like the cryostat in the experiment. 
So the, um, the discretizing itself is not really the highest limitation that we have, but there's other things that um, come into account. And that was also relevant to cut the spectrum because the slow frequencies were in principle possible to generate um, with the AWG, but it was complicated because other experimental um, limitations. I see. So it was more because like when you try to sample at a different uh, rate, I guess your, your optimal uh, point has changed. So you kind of have to adjust that again. Yeah, so if you sample at a different rate, it can be that it gets a bit better, but we would still have some limitations after that, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, no, I see no more questions. So thank you very much for a nice talk. Uh, so the next speaker will be uh, uh, Michael Perelstein from uh, Alto University. We'll talk about large scale quantum hybrid solution for linear systems of equations. Yeah. Hi, thank you. So, yeah. Hi, Mikhail. quoting yeah. Alexander Blade would appear that one of the most fundamental questions in physics, do you see my slides? Yeah, yeah. Yes, perfect. Go ahead. You still around? What the hell? It's not just you, you're on, I don't hear. Yes. I yeah, I, 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 I'm here. I'm sorry for some reason I was kicked off the meeting. That's fine. So, so did you freeze up your, your, your screen? No, now I'm trying to share and it says to me that only the host can share in this meeting now you should be you should be in a position to uh... now you can share so i have to give you the privileges again since you logged in oh, i see it's time limited huh okay so does it work now it seems so okay yeah great yeah, so uh, my name is Michael Perstein, and I'm a researcher at Low Temperature Laboratory at Alta University. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this exciting opportunity to present our recent results on a, a large scale quantum algorithms for uh, linear systems. And also, I would like to thank for this uh, incredible Swedish speaker. It was very tasty. Thank you. So let's get started. So uh, why is it even interesting to solve linear systems of equations? So actually uh, the solution of a really large scale linear system is really a pressing problem and arises in various uh, processing and big data processes like uh, physical simulation of complex systems because uh, many like uh, partial derivative, derivative equations can be reduced to linear systems and even such uh, nonlinear uh, problems could be also linearized and reduced to a large linear system and that basically how these high performance solvers works and it could be performed efficiently uh, using quantum resources. Also the stochastic process analysis uh, where we need to perform some uh, anomaly detection and it should be really fast and by using some uh, approaches like the quantum fingerprinting it could be done on the quantum hardware and of course the machine learning because linear System of equation is basically linear algebra and quantum and machine learning is about linear algebra and many subroutines are very uh, cost challenging and computationally challenging and these quantum approaches could really boost their performance. So uh, how is it possible to solve algorithm uh, to solve the linear system of equation using quantum approaches? So the problem uh, can be formulated as following that we have some matrix A and we have a vector B and basically what we need to find is some vector X, uh, which is the solution of the linear system. And the first uh, approach was introduced by Haro, Hasidim and Lloyd uh, in 2009. And uh, they consider this particular problem and also they introduced uh, like three main 
uh, numbers that describe the complexity of the linear system is the n, which is the size uh, of linear system, number of variables. K here is a conditional number, which is the ratio of the largest eigenvalue to the minimal eigenvalue. And also E here is the uh, error in the approximation of the solution. In this algorithm, to use a Hamiltonian simulation to encode classical data, classical metrics inside the quantum circuits, quantum phase estimation algorithm and amplitude amplification to ensure that we really get the final solution. Uh, then uh, this approach was improved uh, in terms of the conditional number uh, and uh, it was possible to achieve this uh, linear scaling. And the real groundbreaking work was uh, done by Childs et al, uh, where they achieve also uh, exponential improvement in error, but they used instead of the quantum phase estimation protocol, they use some kind of a combination of uh, unitaries, but they use some uh, tricky amplitude amplification. And uh, there are actually a lot of nowadays different approaches like adiabatic, like uh, quantum computing uh, on universal quantum devices and uh, so on. But basically in order to really test these algorithms and really to implement the large scale uh, version of them, uh, we focused on the first implementation, the first introduced HHL algorithm, which is based on the quantum phase estimation algorithm that we are going to uh, benchmark uh, on uh, real quantum devices. So in order to do that, we fixed a class of matrices and uh, we fixed uh, starting from uh, some assumptions. So the first assumption is that these matrices are easily implemented in quantum circuits. So we do not consider Hamiltonian simulation and we do not consider the complexity of this operation for this particular work. And also we assume that these matrices have uh, fixed spectrum. So fixed spectrum uh, gives us no scaling and error because we can solve the problem with 100% uh, accuracy since we can encode all the spectrum into some limited amount of qubits and also no scaling in condition number because condition number is fixed since the spec spectrum is also fixed. So uh, let me first of all tell you about a little bit of this HHL algorithm. So the problem uh, was discussed before and basically this matrix should be encoded with the Hamiltonian simulation but basically we need to calculate the exponent of this matrix and somehow implement it in a quantum circuits. Also, this vector B should be also encoded in the uh, state of the qubit and this uh, kind of amplitude encoding. And uh, on the output of the algorithm, you can get the vector for the quantum state that is proportional to the solution. And in total, there are three groups of qubits. First, uh, the register group of qubits, uh, the logarithmic amount of, of N, where N here is the size of linear system. And on the output, you have a solution in this uh, group of qubits. P here is the phase qubit, which uh, allows us to perform quantum phase estimation algorithm. And ANSILA is required to perform the ANSILA quantum encoding step and basically to, to inverse the matrix. So uh, for this particular problem, as I said before, we do not consider Hamiltonian simulation and therefore we formulate problem as, as follows, that we have some physical operator U and basically uh, we do not complete, compute the exponent, but instead we realize this U as a quantum circuit. And we consider three types of these matrices. Uh, first type is the basically tensor product of single qubit gates or TP1, tensor product of single qubit gates. The second, a little bit more complicated uh, uh, version is the tensor product of two qubit gates where we uh, combine these qubits and clusters by two. And the most complicated one is the not a tensor product or NTP. And here we entangle almost all the qubits except uh, the first one. So it can be also considered as the uh, accuracy of the approximation of some random matrix that we increase the complexity of the circuit and therefore there are more uh, free parameters that we can vary to approximate some metrics. And also we introduced uh, the first uh, single qubit gate, which allows us to fix the spectrum. And for this particular matrices, we fix the spectrum in the following way. And for this particular spectrum, we actually need only three phase qubits, which is uh, really great in terms of the benchmark. You know, we can increase the uh, size of the linear system and at the same time, keep the spectrum uh, like this one. So uh, we actually uh, went a little bit further. So we consider particular simple qubit gates 
the control version of them is implemented as a single C node with the help of the single C node. And it actually reduces the circuit, uh, reduces the complexity of the circuit, which really helps of the, for the implementation on the real quantum devices. And also we consider a hybrid approach. Uh, if you uh, take a look on the spectrum and write down it in a binary form, you can actually see that the third bit or the first bit is always one for each uh, for eigenvalues. So it means that actually you don't need a qubit in the quantum phase estimation step, but you can treat it as a classical bit since uh, it is always one. And uh, all these approaches allows us to reduce this kind of circuit, uh, which is quite com complicated because there are three uh, control unitaries to this kind of circuit where we have only two phase qubits and also we can reduce the complexity of the control new operation. And here you can see the reduction in the amount of uh, C nodes basically in the circuit depth and uh, for the problem size. And for real large problem, uh, 10 to the power of 15, we can actually need pretty shallow circuits. And also we need just a uh, log n plus three qubits overall for each matrix type for TP1, TP2 and NTP. So we consider the, first of all, the smallest example, just two by two matrix like this. And we know that the quantum state, which is encoded in this uh, vector is, is basically the solution of this linear system. And we perform this experiment on the IBM Q4 uh, process, uh, two pretty small five qubits and Melbourne and Johannesburg, which uh, have uh, 16 and 20 qubits uh, respectively. And actually here you can see the fidelity and uh, here is the, density matrix, uh, the real and imaginary part. And uh, for the Kanigsberg processor, if we actually take the uh, eigenvector, which corresponds to the largest eigenvalue, it is actually given by this, and this is the experimental results. And this vector is very close to uh, the theoretical one. And this fidelity is actually 97.5%. Uh, so then we also calculate the tomographical fidelity for uh, some random linear system. So we uh, put some random matrices uh, for different types and here's the NTP types and benchmark the performance and here you can see that you can still get about 10 percent of fidelity which is pretty good for these devices because errors are actually quite uh, large but uh, then what is interested what we are interested in is a large scale benchmark and large scale performance and for that we cannot actually get the final quantum state because it is exponentially a uh, complex task. And we introduce the fidelity, uh, which is basically the, uh, so after the measurement, uh, the projection measurement, we get the probability distribution and we have this experimental probability distribution, theoretical probability distribution and probability distribution that is given by the noisy circuit and just uniform distribution. And uh, this fidelity shows how our experimental results closer to the theoretical ones rather than to these uniform ones. And also we consider the digital error model, which is just the product of the fidelities of readout, single qubit uh, gates and two qubit gates. And we analyzed two IBM Q processors, open uh, access uh, QPUs, Melbourne and Johannesburg. And here you can see the noise model results in crosses and lines are uh, the digital error model. And you can see that digital error model actually works for a noisy simulator because these crosses are for simulation. But on the right hand side, these two frames are experimental results. And here you can see that actually digital more model uh, fails to predict the behavior of the fidelity with the increase uh, of the matrix size. And that is because that IBM processors have some correlated errors, which were previously observed in uh, that kind of devices. And that actually uh, spoils the prediction of the digital error model. However, uh, what is important here is we actually solve pretty large system with a 0.04% uh, of fidelity, which is uh, pretty reasonable for these devices. And we utilize 20 qubits. So the solution of this kind of system is actually a record for a linear system solution using real quantum computers because previous were much uh, smaller. And also we compare the runtime of the IBM Q Johannesburg processor with some most important supercomputers from the past, like Atlas, Cray, a, uh, a CR Red, and so on. And we should have shown that basically by using quantum device for this particular problem, you already outperforms, outperformed some very uh, powerful supercomputers. 
like this one. However, of course, if you try to compete with uh, today's supercomputers, of course, you will lose because uh, they're very powerful. And uh, let, let's take a look what we observe here. So, of course, the uh, quantum algorithm with this simplification, hybrid simplification of the circuit gives you uh, logarithmic scaling in the size of the system and fault tolerant uh, quantum computer is far more efficient than a uh, classical computer. However, if you want to solve this problem on a classical device, actually the most uh, efficient way is to do circuit emulation using Schrodinger and Schrodinger Feynman simulation the same way as Google uh, compare the quantum solution classical ones and here is this linear scaling with the solution. And what is interesting that this is more efficient than just pure classical solution, something like cosmos methods, conjugate gradients and so on, which gives actually the uh, quadratic scaling. And what is interesting that all our assumptions, it seems like we simplify the problem, but actually we're not because uh, this assumption do not facilitate the co classical complexity. However, they uh, facilitate the complexity of the quantum circuits. So. Uh, we also compare the Schrodinger simulation with the hybrid uh, HHL algorithm validation on a superconducting CPU with the same errors as a Google Sycamore processor. And what we observed in the same topology, and what we observed that actually quantum solution outperforms in terms of the runtime classical solutions, but for that you need uh, 50, 60 qubits. Uh, however, some, um, we want, I want to emphasize that here uh, comparison was made with the most straightforward simulation techniques that basically include matrix multiplication. And we exp expect that more advanced quantum inspired algorithms may outperform these, uh, this uh, uh, quantum solution. However, this works still in progress, but what is important here that there is a clear algorithmic advantage in solving uh, this problem. So uh, basically in order to uh, really implement this quantum inspired solution of a uh, linear system, we uh, together with the uh, company Navarian, we established the quantum cloud, which is basically the uh, pipeline of the hybrid quantum computation, where there are some quantum applications based on the uh, hybrid quantum kernels and uh, different classical, efficient classical simulations, and on top of the very efficient uh, quantum hardware interface. And of course, the, some native quantum processors are important for this part, but now we have a virtualized machine which allows us to test, to benchmark uh, this implementation. And what is really important here is actually the whole architecture of the calculations. And what I showed before this comparison, uh, the memory is actually the crucial thing which basically defines the performance of the simulator and therefore we have a very efficient approach how to mm, perform this quantum inspired solution with a very uh, large memory multi-node uh, computing. So uh, that brings me to the end of my talk and as a result we basically consider the suitable for these devices linear systems of equations, and we benchmark the QPE, uh, quantum phase estimation based solution. Of course, the next step would be to benchmark more efficient solution like this uh, child's work. And I want to uh, emphasize once again that this is a record breaking uh, linear system solution on uh, quantum devices. And we also showed for this problem a quantum algorithmic advantage because it is uh, far efficient to solve with the quantum or quantum inspired algorithms rather than with them uh, with the classical ones. And uh, besides these not quantum phase estimation based uh, approaches, we aim to perform the efficient Hamiltonian simulation because of course the next step would be to encode the classical data into a quantum device. And uh, we have some very nice ideas. And uh, we also plan to benchmark all these algorithms on the hardware or the QMware, which is the uh, quantum cloud that we established to benchmark these uh, real use case solution like uh, solving uh, partial derivative equations. And if you're interested in, you can check this uh, website and we have a lot of stuff, not only the uh, linear system solver. Thank you very much. And uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, open for questions, please.
Uh, may I? There is a uh, Chiming Chen. Go ahead. Uh, hello, thank you very much for this talk. So I remember one slide you compared the efficiency of your 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 algorithm with some supercomputer or something, and I noticed the dimension is one million, which corresponds to a logical qubit of around twenty. And uh, you also need 20 qubits for quantum Fourier transform, so in total 40. So I'm curious how you do this, or mm -hmm. am I wrong? No, here we actually implement, so we need only 20 qubits. So uh, this is the HHL algorithm. Okay, yeah, so we can take a look in here. So we have actually ancillary qubit. We have two phase qubits because we fix the spectrum in such a way, or you can say this is the approximation of the solution. And basically we're left with 17 qubits and we can encode the vector in 17 qubits and the solution would be also encoded into 17 qubits. So it's two to the power of 17. Okay, okay, I see the, the spectrum matters a lot, right? Yeah, yeah, this, this helps a lot, yeah. Okay, thank because you. here we really want to, to uh, consider a large scale solution, yeah. Any further questions? I see no hands. Would someone like to ask directly? Uh, do you have any plans to uh, go to Google, for instance, and start to, uh, to give them trouble? Yeah, that's actually a very nice <laughs> proposal. Yeah, and we're thinking about this because uh, so that quantum supremacy that they showed is, was for uh, some random circuits, but here there is actually the solution of a, let's say, useful problem, and it could be analyzed from the same perspective as this quantum supremacy experiment was. Yeah, yeah. so that, that is a very nice proposal. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. it's almost obvious, uh, but... Um... So, I mean, uh, as you know, uh, if you have to deal with uh, electron systems and fermions and so on, it's a whole different thing though. I mean, uh, uh, as we discussed with quantum chemistry and so on, uh, uh, the advantages are not so obvious when you have to do all these transformations and uh, et cetera, and, and deep circuits. So it seems uh, you, you are basically saying the, the HHL uh, thing uh, is really quite doable on, on quantum computers in practice. Yeah, I believe, so it very depends on what kind of a problem you're trying to analyze. Because yeah. there are of course some problems that you can implement HHL algorithm and it would be very efficient. But uh, of course, as I said before, for instance, this child's approach is far more efficient in terms of the error, scaling an error, and it would be nice then to be benchmark uh, this approach. Yeah, okay, I really meant just matrix uh, solution, right? I mean, to solve this yeah. type of problem, yes, okay. Yeah. Okay, super then. Uh, I, I see no more hands up there. And uh, if nobody's interrupting me, I, I would like to say thank you very much for a very nice, interesting talk. And um, let's go on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, then the last uh, talk before the break is already on the screen. Thank you. Go ahead, please, Ami. Amy. Sure. Um, good evening or, or good afternoon if you're from ne my neck of the woods. I'd like to thank the organizers. I I'm honored to have the opportunity to talk to you about an error mitigation technique that we've developed, which we call quantum measurement emulation. I do experimental work with superconducting qubits. Here's the obligatory dilution refrigerator picture. And uh, here uh, in the bottom middle, there's an SEM image of the device that I've been working with, uh, three Exmon style transmon qubits. Um, and these two in particular, uh, I've, uh, I have done most of the measurements for this presentation on. Uh, they're all flux tunable, uh, note the flux and microwave drive lines for each. And in the past year, we tuned up a stable high fidelity two qubit gates. So up at the top, you can see an interleaved randomized benchmarking curve showing a CZ fidelity of 99.7 um, maintained over several hours. And we then used these high fidelity gates to demonstrate an operation called density matrix exponentiation, uh, which Will was 
mentioned in his talk this morning, but I know at this point that was several hours ago. Um, and the, the details of density matrix exponentiation aren't particularly important. Uh, what I want to talk to you about uh, today is a neat spin-off project um, that emerged from that work. You see, when we were implementing density matrix exponentiation, we were running circuits of a much greater depth than we had before, almost 100 gates long. And that meant that we were experiencing errors in a regime that was new to us and came up with a new tool to deal with them. There are roughly three basic kinds of errors in quantum computing. Uh, coherent errors, where the qubit is over or under rotated, but has undiminished purity. Uh, incoherent errors, where noise happens stochastically and, and the vector representing the qubit state sinks to the block sphere. Um, and leakage errors, where you start with your population inside the computational basis and, and then some leaks outside. And I'm going to try to convince you that of these, uh, for NISC computing, uh, coherent errors are the worst. Um, consider, if you would, um, these two circuits on the top, uh, an interleaved randomized benchmarking curve, and on the bottom, just a simple chain of CZ gates. And for a, a high fidelity CZ gate, um, when we compare the performance versus circuit length uh, for these two different circuits, um, the difference between them is huge. Um, in the CZ chain, um, the, the fidelity uh, plummets. It's uh, by 12 gates, uh, almost a half. And um, this difference in performance is not due to uh, incoherent errors. Um, the randomized benchmarking circuit takes more time. So there's more time for incoherent errors to accumulate. And it's not due to leakage errors. Uh, there are in fact more CZ gates in the randomized benchmarking curve because there are CZs inside the Cliffords as well as the interleaved CZs. So um, what's going on is that uh, the coherent errors are constructively interfering in a new way. In the randomized benchmarking curve, the uh, random Cliffords uh, are able to, to twirl the error, but in the, in the CZ chain without the intervening random gates, uh, it constructively interferes. So what I want you to take away from this is that coherent errors can be uh, very bad for circuit performance in a way that is difficult to characterize because it depends on the structure of the circuit that is being run. So for running longer circuits, we wanted some technique for mitigating these coherent errors. And as a field, we spent quite some time thinking about error mitigation. And uh, the, the gold standard dream for the future is, of course, to have closed loop uh, feedback-based error correction. Um, but for many reasons, this is challenging to implement in the near term. Uh, decoding error syndromes is hard, and uh, decoding as well as measurement take a, a long time compared to the qubit lifetime. So you accrue a lot of incoherent errors. And measurement also has a, a relatively low fidelity compared to single and now two qubit gates. So in the meantime, we need open loop control solutions. And by open loop control, that's just a, a fancy way of saying uh, control solutions that don't involve feedback. And uh, right now, dynamical decoupling is the go-to open loop error mitigation tool in the quantum experimentalist's toolbox. And with carefully designed pulse sequences, we're able to uh, echo out the noise so that it, it cancels out on itself. It's a, a very effective technique. However, a key thing to notice here is that dynamical re decoupling requires some sort of temporal symmetry of the noise in order to echo it back out on itself. If the noise is coming from a discrete event, say from a gate, then we can't really echo it out in the same way. Another way to think of this is that dynamical decoupling is exceedingly effective against low frequency noise, um, but less so against noise that has a high frequency relative to the spacing of the echoing pi pulses. Um, and that frequency is limited by the time it takes to perform a gate, uh, which means that coherent errors, which don't appear periodically within the circuit, remain unaddressed. So uh, this led us to consider new ways to deal with discrete coherent errors. And we arrived at a technique that we call quantum measurement emulation. First, I want to describe for you what I mean when I say quantum measurement emulation, or QME for short. I'm using the probabilistic application of gates to create the same quantum channel uh, as an actual measurement. 
And I'd like you to consider as an example, a Z axis measurement. I'm showing you a diagram on the top and I'm gonna be showing you state tomography data on the bottom. With some probability, um, you'll measure at zero and some probability of one. And the net effect on the ensemble is to project the qubit state onto the Z axis. Um, and I'm gonna show you this again with a range of initial states on the bottom. However, measurement takes a, a long time, especially compared to a single qubit gates. So we can achieve the same quantum channel much more quickly using a probabilistically applied single qubit gates. With probability half, we can apply an identity operation and uh, probability half apply a Z gate. And uh, this has the same effect on the qubit, essentially a dephasing channel. And I'll show you this again, uh, varying the initial state in the tomography data, identity, Z, then uh, the average between the two. And uh, this can work for any input state. And in fact, with correctly chosen gates, we can emulate measurement along any axis. And here, for example, uh, we probabilistically apply either an identity or an X gate, and this emulates measurement along the X axis. Now, I want to give you some intuition for how this works as an error mitigation technique. Imagine preparing the qubit in the ground state and a coherent error rotates away. After a quantum measurement emulation, the resulting state is much closer uh, to the original state. And what's going on here is that the quantum measurement emulation projects coherent errors that are transversal to the measurement axis into incoherent errors. We can um, make a plot of the trace distance to the initial state after an error has occurred, an artificially induced error here, for varying error strengths. And we see that applying um, QME um, makes us insensitive to the error to first order. Here I'd like to note that I'm plotting a 1 minus the trace distance, uh, so is that here in this plot 1 corresponds to no error. Um, I'm doing this to facilitate comparison to fidelity, uh, which I'm familiar with as an experimentalist, and, and which will show up again later in the presentation. Uh, here I'm also normalizing out spam errors. Of course, um, to use QME for a single qubit, uh, one must know which axis can be measured along without disrupting the quantum information. For single qubit, then, uh, this technique can be used uh, primarily for state stabilization, but the, the power of QME becomes apparent when it is paired with stabilizer codes, um, where the code is designed so that parity measurements can be made without disrupting the quantum information. And um, given the audience, I'm sure that um, almost everybody knows what a stabilizer code is, but just in case someone doesn't, uh, a three qubit repetition code is an excellent example, where the logical zero is three physical zeros, and logical one is three physical ones, and uh, the measurements Z1, Z2, and Z2, Z3 um, are, are the stabilizers for this code. They're both one for the code words, um, but if you leave the code space, one of those measurements will be a, a minus one. And uh, the key idea here is to use QME to emulate stabilizer measurements, thereby mitigating coherent errors that rotate the state out of the code space um, by making them incoherent. And I'm going to show you uh, some demonstrations with a simple Bell state based code uh, stabilized by ZZ. Emulating the ZZ measurement is no more complicated than emulating a single qubit measurement. Um, with probability half, we'll apply an identity gate now to both qubits, and probability half a Z gate to both. And um, if we do the same thing we did on the last slide, where we prepare an initial logical state and then apply uh, some coherent error intentionally, uh, here specifically I'm applying an, an RZ tensor RZ error, uh, we can look at the effect of QME versus error strength um, for that coherent error that rotates out of the code space. And we see that, again, uh, we've achieved a first order insensitivity to the coherent error. And we're able to mitigate errors in entangled states using single qubit gates. So far, uh, the circuits that I've shown you have been toy examples with intentionally introduced errors. Um, but now I'd like to examine how QME performs in the face of real errors. Now, the dominant source of coherent errors in superconducting qubits comes from two qubit gates. So the first circuit I'd like to show you is just a simple chain 
of two qubit gates. Uh, and in the code that I'm using, uh, CZ is not a logical gate, so I'm applying them in pairs. Uh, in a sense, you can think of the circuit as a, an extended identity operation that's stuffed full of two qubit gate errors. And, and between every two gates, I'm going to insert a QME operation for error mitigation. And we can look at the effects of adding QME, both in terms of a trace distance on the top and fidelity on the bottom. And we see that the gray uncorrected trace has the drop and revival, which is characteristic of coherent errors, uh, where the green trace with QME has a smooth monotonic decay, indicating that the coherent errors have been made incoherent. And the trace with QME has an overall improved performance, um, even though the circuit is longer. But uh, now let's turn to a slightly more complicated circuit uh, with slightly less symmetry. Uh, this is very similar to the last circuit, but instead of being just a string of CZ gates, um, after every pair of CZ gates, I'm also inserting a logical Z gate, which in this code happens to just be a, a physical Z gate on one of the qubits. Um, and I'm going to use this slightly more complicated circuit to show you that QME can address coherent errors that don't have the symmetries needed uh, by dynamical decoupling in order to echo them out. So to perform dynamical decoupling, I'm going to be echoing around uh, the stabilizers, uh, inserting XX into the circuit. Um, and to perform QME, I'll be stochastically applying either an XX or an identity operation in the same places. And um, when I simulate the performance of the circuit, when there's a small over rotation in the CZ gate, um, both a, a small single qubit and the a conditional over rotation, uh, we see that QME is much more effective at mitigating the effects of this coherent error. And I'm looking forward to uh, taking the, the data for these circuits um, on a device after I fix uh, a leak in my refrigerator. So um, quickly, uh, before uh, concluding, I would just like to compare QME to a, another error mitigation technique, which uses randomization to uh, address coherent errors, namely randomized compiling. Um, and they're similar, but, but also different, um, where QME emulates uh, measurement and is focused on, on logical qubits and state stabilization, um, randomized compiling as the concept of twirling error and is, is more focused towards physical qubits. So uh, for QME, after each coherent error, the QME operation is inserted. Um, in randomized compiling, um, a, a twirling gate is inserted before uh, and an inverse twirling gate after the coherent error. Um, and in, in QME, uh, the gates that are inserted are, are chosen from just a set of two gates, either identity or the stabilizer for the measurement in question. And um, no matter uh, how many qubits are in the, the state that you're measuring for each emulated measurement, um, it's just these two options. But uh, for randomized compiling, uh, there is a, a larger gate set. The, the gate set used for twirling is generated by the poly gate, so, so that increases with the number of qubits. Uh, and finally, um, QME uh, renders a transverse coherent error incoherent um, by, by turning it into a dephasing channel where randomized compiling um, turns it into a, a depolarizing channel. So, so um, they're just different techniques and, and QME happens to be tailored towards the application uh, of interest for our group, namely density matrix exponentiation. So uh, to sum, um, quantum measurement emulation is a new open loop control technique for logical qubits that is designed for coherent errors that dynamical decoupling can't echo out. I've shown how this technique improves circuit performance and how it can outperform dynamical decoupling in some situations. And with that, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the rest of my team, um, both the grad students and postdocs on campus, and also the fantastic folks out at Lincoln Laboratory. In particular, I'd like to thank Molly Schwartz, Morton Kiergaard, and Gabriel Samick for their assistance and insights. Um, and with that, I would be happy to take any questions that you have. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. That was great. Uh, so it's open for questions. So far, I only see clapping hands. Oh, there is a question. Yes. Uh, 
Baptiste Droye. Hi, Amy. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, do you see your, uh, this QME can be used for uh, calibration as well? Because it seems that the improvement you get is only related to amount of coherent errors. So can you see using the same kind of techniques, but now for calibrating some non-trivial coherent errors in your uh, system? Oh, I see. You're suggesting using it to uh, discern whether errors are coming from coherent or incoherent errors, so, so you can fix the coherent errors. Um, yeah. I had not thought of that, but that's a good idea. I, I think it could be used for that, yes. Uh, all right, Ingrid Stromberg, go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm wondering in the some of the earlier slides, you mentioned being insensitive to first order, and I'm wondering first order in what? Oh, sure. Um, uh, let me, let me um, see if I can pull up that those plots again. Um, here, can you see my screen again? Yeah. So, so in this plot, as I'm plotting uh, the rotation error on the x-axis, um, you, you can see that in the QME curve, it's, uh, it's very flat. Uh, for small errors, uh, where without the correction, there's just a, a straight um, dash down, um, mo modulate a, a little kink that's that's due to uh, state, initial, state initialization errors. Um, so that's what I mean when I say it's first order insensitive, that for um, small uh, angles of, of coherent error, um, the, uh, the, the trace distance remains um, flat. Thanks. Sure. Um, thanks for asking. See no more hands. Uh, anybody would like to ask a straight question? Uh, something Baptiste said reminded me. Uh, your method seems to be designed really to be good for for coherent errors, sort of correlated errors, right? But. Um, like if you have a mixture of everything, uh, doesn't this take sort of time? Uh, uh, you'll have to have a number of different kinds of methods working together all the time. I mean, there's a certain overhead here. Uh, I mean, if, if the errors don't happen to be mostly correlated, or how do you handle? Um, is your question that... What do you do uh, if, the, if, you, uh, if you make a design for actually working this way and the errors happen to be mostly incoherent? Oh, if they're mostly incoherent, then um, this is not going to be a particularly effective technique for improving your um, circuit output. Uh, right, so, so I'm sort of wondering what sort of flexibility you have in a real situation of, of having optimal architectures. So, and I understand fully that, that this is really to investigate uh, this case, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. bottom, sort of, so I was interested in how, how to implement this in sort of real architectures later, but that's a later question, I guess. Sure, and one, there's always a trade-off between uh, coherent and incoherent errors when one is, is doing gate calibration, um, because you know generally, uh, if you make a gate longer, then you'll have more time for more precise control um, and for uh, finer bandwidth signals that you're, you're sending down to your qubits. But then, of course, uh, incoherent error kicks in, and so so typically. Um, Gates are, are calibrated, so there's about a 50-50 balance of uh, incoherent and coherent errors. Um, and this is targeted at, at the incoherent error um, part of that. Yeah. So you get to, you have to get to know your device really. Yeah, okay, That's thank you good. very, very much. for a And uh, thank you all speakers so far in this session. So we now have a break ahead. Uh, we are only five, we are a little bit late, but not much, but maybe, uh, shall we stick? I think we stick to this, to, to the, uh, to the, um, uh, we, we get back at 19, in 10 minutes, in 1940, I think that then we keep schedule and don't mess things up if people want to go away and come back. So, uh, 1940. We come back. Thank you.
Ana Martin, are you around? Yes, here I am. Super. Hi. 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 Uh, okay. Uh, so I, I just ask Madita first if if she's around uh, to also. Yes, I am. Good. Then we take an order. Anna, you test. No, wait a minute. By the way, Madita, uh, you are you test your your screen first uh, and uh, and see if you can hook on. Yes. So you should see my yeah, screen. Yeah. Super. Ganz gut. Yeah. Thank you. I should see the presentation. Right, it's perfect. Okay, very good. Yep. So now, now, now you can actually take take the screen, and, and we can continue from there. Okay, let's see. So, um, all right. Oh, shoot! I have to give them permissions. Sorry, I thought I already have done that. But you you don't have the permission, right? Uh, yeah, so no uh, permission now, right? to. I have to give uh, Zoom permission to us access my computer. Oh, that. So I have to leave and come back like really quick. Okay. Okay, Anna is back on track, it seems. Okay, you, you can hear me now, right? Yes, I can see you. Okay, then I think I can share now. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Super. Yeah, Very okay. Good. Very good. Go ahead, please. Fight. Okay, so shall I start, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, sure, sure, absolutely. 15%. Perfect. So. <laughs> Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Ana Martin and well, I first want to thank the organizers of the workshop uh, for both organizing this workshop and also to for having me here and all of the audience for sticking around until these very late uh, talks. <laughs> so thank you all. My name is Ana Martin. I am a PhD student uh, at QT Center in the University of the Basque Country and I am uh, uh, dedicating my PhD to the uh, uh, research of the of uh, uh, different com uh, computational paradigms uh, to oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I, I am studying uh, the implementation of, uh, of quantum algorithms using different uh, different computational paradigms. That's it. So to, uh, this evening, I would like to tell you about this digital analog uh, quantum computational paradigm and how to use it to implement a quantum algorithm. So this might be an alternative paradigm for this uh, NISC era that we are living in. <laughs> so first, I would like to tell you about how this uh, digital quantum computation paradigm is right now in the NISC era and why this uh, other proposal, digital analog, might be a nice midterm term solution to the NISC um, technology um, limitations that we are facing. Then I would like to show you the comparison of the performance of both algorithms in the implementation of, of uh, known quantum algorithms. In, in this case, it would be quantum Fourier transform. Then I will uh, show you the conclusions and then maybe the perspective and related, related publications. Hopefully we have time for all of this. So uh, digital quantum computation is the most extended uh, paradigm uh, for computational paradigms, the building blocks of, uh, of this paradigm uh, to change the state of a single qubit are the digital pulses applied to one qubit, so single qubit gates. And to create any entanglement and superposition, the building block might be uh, digital pulses applied simultaneously to two qubits, so two qubit gates. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm kind of nervous because I, I cannot see me. Okay. 
maybe I can. Okay, sorry, I only watched uh, half my screen. I'm sorry. Okay, so using this digital uh, computational paradigm, it is possible to, to implement short depth quantum circuits in NISC devices with high fidelity rates. However, whenever we want to uh, implement a long depth, depth quantum circuit, we can face some, uh, some, some errors and, and, and some drawbacks as uh, the depth of the quantum algorithm increases, the resources we need uh, to implement it increases as well. So experimentally, maybe uh, implementing single qubit gates present no problem. So they are efficient to perform and present almost no, almost no, no noise. But uh, this doesn't happen whenever we want to implement two qubit gates. Normally, we have uh, significant noise rates that accumulate along all of the all of the process, and this is due to the cross stack between the qubit of the system. It is important to to note to notice that uh, several works are being carried out right now to improve this situation, and they are uh, achieving uh, significantly good results. However, these uh, improvements in the um, in the experimental realization of, of quantum computers are not available in all of the NISC devices we have. But still, these devices are, are interesting machines to work with. So uh, CrossTAC is an experimental limitation that prevents us to use these uh, NISC devices that we have nowadays. Um, so it, it is preventing us to advance in the field of quantum computing. But it is interesting to still use these machines to keep working uh, until we have this uh, fault tolerant quantum computer already designed. So what if instead of seeing crosstalk as a problem, we see it as a resource? That would be like perfect. <laughs> and it, that is precisely what the digital analog paradigm tries to do. So what is digital analog <laughs> paradigm? Digital analog uh, computational paradigms combines the digital pulses and the analog block blocks to create uh, to change the state of the qubit and create entanglement and superposition in the system. The digital pulses are, are implemented by single qubit gates, and the analog blocks are uh, performed by the time evolution of the interaction Hamiltonian that is uh, inherent to the quantum processor. This is the natural interaction that uh, arises between the qubits. As you can see, there are not two qubit gates in these paradigms. So that might give you an idea of how these paradigms um, is claiming to be better right now than the DQC, the fully digital one. So the digital analog paradigm combines the flexibility of the digital computation and the robustness, robustness of uh, the analog simulation. So let's see how this might work. Let's use a digital analog to simulate an icing model. As a resource, we will have the homogeneous icing Hamiltonian, so an easy one, and, and the single qubit gates, it would be X rotations. And the goal, the final goal is to, to simulate an inhomogeneous icing Hamiltonian. So we start with the homogeneous one, which would uh, would be the, the interaction Hamiltonian between the qubits of the quantum processor, and by applying digital analog, we will we will be we will, we will have this uh, inhomogeneous Hamiltonian. For the example, let us uh, think that we have a nearest neighbor architecture in the processor, so a line of four qubits. If we do nothing at the beginning of the system, we have this this Hamiltonian, the homogeneous uh, icing one. Then we apply a, a single qubit rotation on the first qubit, let the system interact during a certain time uh, T1, and apply, and apply again this uh, single qubit rotation. By this, uh, by this operation, what we have, uh, the Hamiltonian that described the system is this one. So we have introduced a, a variable, which is the T1 in the, in the Hamiltonian. We do the same and we apply a second rotation in, uh, in the second qubit, let the system interact during a different time, which is T2, and again apply this uh, single qubit gate on the, on the same second qubit. Then we will have, by the same mechanism, we will have this Hamiltonian as the one that is described in the system. And finally, we perform a third rotation on the third qubit, let the system interact during uh, this T3 time, apply again the single qubit gate, and we end up in uh, having this Hamiltonian as the, 
as the one that is describing the system. So we have uh, applied three pairs of single qubit gates. And now if you see, uh, if well, you can, you can see that we have this inhomogeneous icing Hamiltonian where this, uh, these factors are, pre are precisely the, the arbitrary couplings of the inhomogeneous Hamiltonian. So in the end, the problem reduces to find up an appropriate map between the times and the, and the inhomogeneous um, and, the, and the Hamiltonian coupling. So we can, we can simulate this in, in homogeneous uh, icing Hamiltonian by only having to apply analog blocks and digital gates. This, uh, in the case that we have uh, an old tool connectivity instead of a nearest neighbor, instead of applying only one single gate between the analog blocks, we, we, we would have to apply two single gates, but the procedure is the same and the result would be exactly the same. The same. You can have more information in, uh, about this in the, in the publication that you see at the bottom of, of this slide. So the method that I have described you before is the stepwise DAQC. It is universal and therefore it is equivalent to the fully di digital paradigm. Uh, the, the main characteristic is that the interaction, interaction among the qubits is switched on and off between, between its uh, single qubit gates. So single qubit gate, then an analog block, another single qubit gate, and, and the, on and on until the very end of the, of the implementation. However, there is another paradigm called bank digital analog. And in this case, the interaction Hamiltonian is never switched off and the single rotations are applied on top of the analog dynamics. This, uh, this introduces an, an inherent, inherent error as it does not implement exactly the, the, the algorithm. But when, uh, when the experimental errors are taken into account, and I will show you in the next slides, uh, it happens to scale up better than the uh, stepwise or the fully digital paradigm. And this is due uh, to the, and this is done because of the time that takes to, to apply the single qubit gate is significantly smaller than the time uh, that we need to stabilize the analog interaction. So since we only have to turn the interaction on once along all of the process, we only face the, the, the stabilizing problem once instead of, of having to, to take that into account every time that we turn on and off as will be the case of the stepwise um, version. So how would it look like this implementation in compared to the fully digital one? L let me show you with this uh, quantum circuit for the quantum Fourier transform. In this case, it's a three qubit implementation. So it's an easy one. I just want you to, to I just want to show you how this might be, how that, this might uh, look. So this would be the digital implementation. Uh, you can see that we have a single and two qubit gates, that's all. This would be the stepwise. So single qubit gates and then interaction blocks, again, single qubit gates and on and on. And this would be the bank uh, implementation. We turn the, the interaction on and doesn't, uh, um, we don't turn it off and then the, until the very end of the process. And the single qubit gates are performed on top of these interactions. What we wanted to do is to compare the implementation of a, a known quantum algorithm that can, can have a really significant long depth and, and see how does it perform in compared to the fully digital one. So for, to do this, we have to take into account the experimental sources that we can, uh, the, sorry, the noise sources that, that we are expecting to have. More or less are the same experimental sources, uh, noise sources. So we expect to have uh, some experimental errors whenever we apply a single qubit gate. We also expect to have, of course, measurement error, uh, bit flip error, also the coherence, and uh, we might get affected by thermal relaxation. And the difference between digital and digital analog implementation might be on the errors that arises from the implementation of the two qubit gates. These experimental errors will only appear in the fully digital case, but not in the analog, in the digital analog. And the contrary happens with the experimental error that we expect to have whenever we apply the analog blocks. We won't have these errors, of course, in the fully digital one, 
but we have to take them into account whenever we want to implement the, the digital analog. So we have included all of these errors in the simulation of the quantum Fourier transform, and we have implemented uh, this algorithm for three, five, and six qubits in order to get a fair comparison, comparison between these two paradigms. So we have applied this uh, quantum Fourier transform to this family of states that I have uh, show you, uh, shown you in, in the top of this slide. The figure of merit that we have used for the compar comparison is the fidelity, uh, where rho ideal is the state after the application of the quantum Fourier transform with no noise taken into account. And rho noisy is the resulting state whenever the noise model is implemented, both in digital and digital analog um, uh, implementation. And uh, the values that of the parameters that we have used to simulate the different noise sources are chosen to model realistic NISC uh, superconductive uh, devices. But these values can be changed as, as they change in the experimental implementation of NISC devices. If you here, uh, now I would like to refer to you to the figure on the right where you can see the, um, the fidelity of these, uh, of the different implementations. If you uh, see by color, so all of the green represent all of the green lines represent the implementation of six qubit quantum Fourier transform, and so it does the blue one and the and the black one. And if you and as you can see, the bank protocol, the fidelity is always uh, above the fidelity of, of the rest of the protocols. So the, the highest uh, fidelity is, of, is obtained always for the bank digital analog uh, protocol. Um, uh, this protocol present uh, uh, a better tolerance to the decoherence than the digital one due to the shorter time of the application of the analog blocks respect to the two qubit gates. And, and this is why the digital in, uh, fidelity is so low in all of the implementations. And then uh, we expected to have these results, uh, I mean, in the comparison between bank and stepwise digital analog implementation, uh, since the, the errors derived from the turning on and off interaction uh, that we can face whenever we apply the, the stepwise uh, protocol is significantly higher than the error that we expect to have in the, in the bank protocols because of what I told you about turn this turning this interaction only once so to say it in a in a short uh, sentence the bank protocol always perform better than the stepwise and the digital uh, protocol so in conclusion uh, I, I as i have told you these devices uh, suffer from important noise sources whenever a two qubit gaze is, is applied Although several implementations, uh, several improvements are being are being uh, taken are being implemented in experimental setups, these improvements are not uh, available in all of these devices. So maybe it's it's interesting to to take this digital analog approach to overcome the experimental limitations of of, of the experimental devices. The main idea behind this pro this uh, paradigm is to get advantage of the natural interaction that arises between the qubits instead of treating uh, it of treating this interaction as a noise source as does the the fully digital digital paradigm we have uh, shown a realistic simulation of the implementation of of the quantum Fourier transform using both paradigms and the result that we have uh, uh, have get shows that this paradigm is an interesting alternative um, uh, to alternative paradigm uh, that allow us to implement long def quantum algorithms in the NISC devices. As per perspective, we would like to take the simulation to the next level, of course, and implement it in a quantum device and see if the, the results that we are, that we are expect, expecting to have correspond to the, to the reality. Also, we are applying the digital analog paradigm to the implementation of, re of another relevant long def quantum algorithms, such as the HHL. And this is some work that we are doing right now. Also, we are uh, working in the implementation of, of variational quantum algorithms using these paradigms. And we are also thinking about including uh, some error mitigation techniques similar as the ones that Amy have uh, told us before 
to this to this formalism. And of course, the the telos of our investigation might be to have this digital analog quantum computer and try to get the best uh, outperformance of this experimental realization. And well, we have been working a lot in this uh, paradigm. And here you have the most recent works that we have done. And that would be all from my side. And I expect uh, that you have enjoyed this talk and I have made myself clear enough. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, open for questions. Waiting for uh, the uh, questions. I, I have one. I could. Uh, I'm a little surprised that you refer to NISC all the time because, in principle, this is a, a, a computing a sort of paradigm, a model. I mean, um, it's basically independent of the errors. I mean, could just as well be a perfect uh, application, even in, in noiseless computers, right? So. Uh, uh, so, I mean, it's basically idiomatic computing with the digital uh, operations on it, right? Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. it. So but it, I, it, yeah, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, please. And I, yeah, no, no, but you're right. I am always referring to these NISC devices, but it's not only um, uh, focused to, to these devices. But the reason that I do this is because, well, we are right now in NISC era in so to speak. So I think it's interesting to not focus only on one in one computational paradigm as we are as we have been doing in the latest year with this digital paradigm. So I would like to give this uh, this vision that we can use different paradigms to get advantage of the technology that we already have. But you are right that this is not only focused to this technology. This is an interesting paradigm that can be applied in several technologies. So you are completely right, yes. I mean, uh, by the way, I mean, you know, well, yeah, Kika Solana and we have, we have been promoting DAC for, for fifth, many years already. So uh, it's, uh, but, but uh, basically it means you, you actually manipulating the Hamiltonian. I mean, you really, um, the substrate is what you're, basing the thing in, and then you're doing uh, digital operations on that. And that's, of course, in a sense, more, 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 more uh, versatile and might be advantages, that's for sure. Hmm. Okay, uh, is there any, any, uh, any questions? So what, what's your um, large, you have any large scale applications in mind? Yeah, well, currently we are working in this, in the HHL implementation. And I mean, we are facing interesting results and this is like the most big implementation that we have in mind, but also we are working in the variational algorithms that is, and that's something that we haven't worked yet. Uh, I mean, in this, with this paradigm. But yes, that, that's our, those are the biggest focus that we have in mind right now. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I see no further questions or, or comments. So, so then, thank you very much, Anna. That was thank very you. nice to hear. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So then uh, next and final talk is by Madita Wilsch from uh, Volkswagenzentrum Ulich uh, in Germany. So. Uh, Go ahead and share screen, please. Great, you're on. Okay, so I think now you can also hear me. But you, your, your voice is low. Okay, sorry about that. Is it better like this? It's better. Okay, then I will do it like this. Okay, yeah, uh, hello. So, uh, yeah, I would like to thank the organizers, of course, for inviting me and I will be talking about uh, some experiments that we did on the Ulysses Universal Quantum Computer Simulator um, with a QAOA. And what do I mean by a quantum computer simulator? So I'm talking about an algorithm that runs on the classical computer. So basically we 
using a classical computer to uh, simulate the full circuit and the full wave function of the quantum computer. So if we have an n qubit uh, quantum computer, then we have the n qubit wave function, which has like uh, many basis states. So all these um, basis states are numbered from all bits zero to all bits one. And this is um, n to the uh, two to the n um, states. And then we also have these complex amplitudes here. And yeah, on the classical computer, we store them all in a vector. So we have two to the n complex coefficients. And usually we use complex double precision uh, to represent these numbers. And storage of these uh, numbers takes then 16 times two to the n bytes of RAM. So what does it mean then for different numbers of qubits? So if you only have like four qubits, then it's not a lot. And also for 16 qubits, it's still not a problem. But if you now get in the range of like 30 qubits, then we already need quite a lot of RAM. So um, yeah, if we have like 31 qubits, we need 32 gigabyte of RAM and that's already the limit of like my computer, for example. So if you want to simulate more qubits, for example, 42, then it's already 64 terabyte of RAM. So this we can actually only do on a supercomputer. And how do we simulate then these gates? So luckily the gates are usually two, uh, one or two qubit gates. So basically we can uh, do all these uh, gates by just doing two or four component updates of the state vector. So we don't need the full uh, two to the n by two to the n matrix, but we only need the coefficients of the, of the gate. So for example, if we have a single qubit gate, then we have four coefficients. So we only need those four coefficients. And then of course the amplitudes that these connect. So these stars here represent all the um, other bits. And for yeah, a, a single qubit gate, we need then two amplitudes and these four coefficients to update these two amplitudes. And then we have to do this for, for all these combinations of the other bits. So we basically go through the full state vector. And yeah, the Unit Universal Quantum Computer Simulator is actually a simulator that simulates the full state vector. So on contrast, we also have this uh, Feynman simulator where we only compute some particular amplitudes at the end of the circuit. But this um, universal means that we actually simulate the, the full circuit and we have in principle all amplitudes. And um, JAX, so it's short for this um, simulator, uh, was also used um, in the quantum supremacy experiment uh, by Google. So it was used in the in the simulation part, of course. And it simulates an ideal gate based quantum computer. So we do not have like decoherence and dephasing. Uh, we can in principle insert random Pauli errors because we can insert them in the circuit, but basically the simulator uh, simulates the circuit like we feed it. And the good thing is it has a very efficient MPI communication scheme. So we can actually use distributed memory. So as I said, we are basically limited by RAM. So if the required RAM is more than fits on a single node, then we need distributed memory. And then we need a communication between the nodes so that we can actually run this uh, code on the supercomputers. And this is implemented in JAX. So how many qubits can we now simulate? As I said, we are basically limited by RAM. So on my notebook, I could do 30 qubits. And at JSC, we can do uh, 43 qubits on the supercomputer jewels on cluster and booster modules. And we can do 42 qubits on the Joule's booster if we use uh, the GPUs. So there we can do one qubit less, but this is much faster than 
uh, using the CPUs. So now I come to the application. So for those who don't know the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, just a very short overview. So it's a variational algorithm to find approximate simulations, uh, solutions to optimization problems. And the variational state is given by this. So we have an alternating uh, series of these exponentials and we start in the state where every qubit is in the plus state. So the equal superposition of up and down. And what are all these things in here? So the beta and the gamma are the variational parameters. And then we have those two Hamiltonians here. And this first Hamiltonian is usually called the mixing Hamiltonian and is often given by this. So we always have a sigma x on each qubit. And then we have this uh, second part, which is called the problem Hamiltonian uh, because it encodes the optimization problem. And often it's, for example, the easing Hamiltonian. And what we then have to do is to optimize the energy. So we minimize the expectation value of the problem Hamiltonian in this variational state. So another thing which I have to uh, introduce shortly is uh, quantum annealing because I want to come to the um, relation between QAO and quantum annealing. So what is quantum annealing? So very short, it's um, based on the adiabatic theorem. So we want to, um, yeah, we initialize a quantum system in the ground state of a Hamiltonian um, at time equals zero. So the Hamiltonian should be at least uh, so that we know the ground state and we can initialize the system in this state. Then the Hamiltonian um, changes in time. And if this happens uh, sufficiently slowly, then the quantum system stays in its instantaneous ground state. So basically, if we have a Hamiltonian at the end of this process where we want to find the ground state, we can start with an easy ground state and just change the Hamiltonian from the first one to the second one. And then this Hamiltonian looks like this. So we have the initial Hamiltonian and the final Hamiltonian and two functions which uh, interpolate between these. And these have to satisfy these uh, uh, conditions so that we really start in the initial Hamiltonian and end in the final Hamiltonian. Uh, here we have an annealing schedule where we see the functions a and b. So they are taken from the uh, e-wave annealing schedule and we also use the scheme uh, for our work. So how do these initial and final Hamiltonians look like? So quite often they look like this and this is actually, yeah, the same as for the QA way on the other slide. So actually quite often those Hamiltonians look the same. So if we now want to simulate the time evolution of a quantum annealing process, so this means we have to solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation with this uh, time-dependent Hamiltonian here, then we usually use the suzuki trotter product formula algorithm. And for this, we use the decomposition of the uh, time evolution operator. Then uh, it looks like the QAO variation in state. And so what do we do now? So we use this uh, decomposition from the product formula of the quantum annealing process and use a coarse discretization with a large time step. So we are not actually sure that we do an accurate uh, simulation of quantum annealing and this is not um, the goal, so to say. And we also use a rather small time step so that the time for this process is quite short that we do not expect that this um, would be an adiabatic evolution even if we uh, are in the genuine quantum annealing regime. So we study this approximate quantum annealing we uh, call aqua, uh, first as an independent heuristic method, but also as the um, initialization for the variational parameters of uh, QAOA. 
And in our study, we use um, exact, cover, exact cover problems with uh, 30 to 40 qubits. And here are some of the, resu of the results. So we have the um, success probability. So the prob probability to find the, um, the ground state. And we see here uh, aqua for 50 steps and QA wave for uh, seven and 13 steps. And what we see is that in a large range here, we actually have quite uh, similar probabilities. And down here, we uh, think that the optimizer of QA wave probably got stuck in a poor uh, local minimum. Uh, yeah, what we also see is that for aqua, we have yeah, 50 steps, so much larger than for QA way. But then for QA way, we also need um, many uh, energy evaluations for the optimization. In fact, we used like 150 to 200 um, evaluations, so calls to the simulator. And yeah, this is much more than the 50 steps for Aqua. So then how can we um, see this in the efficiency? So if we have um, Aqua with P steps, then this requires approximately the same time as a single energy evaluation for the uh, P-step aqua. Um, but this P-step aqua energy evaluation does not include the optimization. So if we want to use the optimization in the QA way, then we may need like M energy evaluations. And um, this means that uh, P-step QA way runs M times longer than p-step aqua. So in the same time that we can run uh, p-step QA way, including the optimization, we can run m times p-step aqua. Um, yeah, the same the other way around, so to say. Uh, p-step QA way is, F is efficient as n-step aqua if the number of energy evaluations is smaller or equal to n divided by p. And as we saw before, we had aqua with uh, n equals 50, but we had energy evaluations for QA or more than 100. So in this sense, uh, aqua is much more efficient. So does aqua now solve all the problems? Well, probably not, as we do not expect that an m times p step aqua will work very well on current NIST devices, because this would be a very um, high depth quantum circuit. So we study then um, aqua also with uh, smaller time steps and possibly as an initialization for the QA way. So if we have many steps, then we see we can reach quite good um, probabilities for aqua for different time steps. So for up to time step of uh, 0 0.4 nanoseconds, we actually get improvement if we increase the number of steps and also if we increase the step size. And how can we explain this? So probably in this regime, we are still yeah, close to quantum annealing. So we see if we increase the number of steps or the size of the step, then we actually increase the annealing time. And with increasing annealing time, we get uh, better results. But this does not hold anymore for this case with a time step of 0 0.8 nanoseconds. So here we are really out of the uh, quantum annealing regime. Um, yeah, what can we do now uh, with QA -way? So we start with the initializations from aqua and then optimize the parameters. And we actually find that for time steps up to 0 0.4 nanoseconds, we can really get a good improvement. But in this case where we have the time step of 0 0.8, there's not really a visible improvement here. So how can we understand this? So we believe that in those cases where we are still in this quantum annealing regime, we can uh, with QA way somehow improve the annealing schedule. And in those cases where we are no longer in the uh, quantum annealing regime, so this might probably not work like this anymore. So can we conclude now? Um, if we have a large number of steps, then aqua is still very good and 
more efficient than QA way. But if we have a small number of steps, then um, Aqua might be a good solution for an initialization for QA way. But what if we just take uh, one instance of a uh, problem and use QAOA to optimize the parameters and then use these parameters for other instances. So this is what we did here. We optimized the parameters for a 30 qubit instance and then evaluated the success probability for um, other qubits in, uh, for other instances with a larger qubit size. And then we see that the probabilities are still quite high. So compared to the uh, just random guessing from uniform distribution, we have uh, quite a lot of improvement, but we also see that we have exponential scaling. So if we uh, increase the qubit number, then the probability gets lower. And although we have prefactors smaller than one, they are still uh, quite close. Um, yeah, what do we see for aqua? So that's the solid lines. Here we see that the improvement is in general less, but we also see that for the larger step sizes, we get uh, higher uh, success probabilities. And what we also see is that the prefactor in these exponents here gets smaller. So actually this case, which did not uh, look so very well on the previous slide, now has actually the best scaling. So this looks actually quite promising. So a um, short summary. Uh, yeah, I introduced the simulation um, of quantum computers with uh, JAX, uh, the concepts of QA and quantum annealing. I talked about approximate quantum annealing and what we understand uh, under this. Uh, yeah, the results were basically comparison of uh, QAUA and Aqua, and we looked at performance, efficiency, and scaling. So what uh, is an outlook for the future? So since the results look quite promising, future steps would include to really test Aqua on genuine quantum hardware, preferably with uh, more than 30 qubits, so that we can compare with our results. But since that's several hundreds of gates, uh, we will probably have to first start with uh, smaller problems. And that's also another thing. So since we only tested um, one set of exact cover problems, we should also see if we can, uh, yeah, if the results on Aqua really generalize also to different problem sets. And yeah, at the end, I want to thank my colleagues who have been working with me on this and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Uh, questions, comments? Yes, uh, Michael Perelstein, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for a very interesting talk. So could you go on slide nine, I think? Yes. Yeah, so in here there is a success probability for a different depth of the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. Mm -hmm. And I thought that with the increase of this P number, you will also will see the improvement in the success probability. So why there is 13 lower than seven in here? So we believe that here the optimizer got stuck in a poor local optimum. And for P equals 13, we have more parameters. So it's probably just more likely that there are more local minima which are less optimal. So, I mean, here it's still higher than the... Yeah, wait. yeah. And for 40 qubits, it is also higher. Yeah, I see. Okay, and I have also a second question. So we use this AQA as a initialization for a quantum approximation transition algorithm. And usually it helps with a barium plateau problem. So have you tried to investigate gradients in case of this uh, wise initialization? Um, so you mean if we studied the landscape around those initial yeah, points yeah. then? Yeah. Uh, no, not really, no. We just um, yeah, did the optimization here. So 
but yeah okay it could probably be that for these cases then there's such a plateau in the vicinity so because here it's already out of the quantum annealing regime right so it behaves yeah. differently than the other ones okay yeah thank you so further questions about this uh, uh, approximate quantum algorithm uh, annealing right uh, you ref for NIST devices and you, you suggested that uh, it would improve uh, with with uh, if you're not in a NISC. I mean, with you have an ideal system, right? Uh, is that because uh, simply you cannot go fast enough, or, or wouldn't you be in problems with the, with the level crossings, etc. Anyway, sooner or later. Yes. Okay. In the limit where we really have a lot of steps, we are of course in the quantum annealing regime, and then we have the same problems as there. But the first problem that we see is that if we have many steps, then we have a lot of gates in the circuit. And yeah, then the errors, of course, accumulate. And for NIST devices, we thus do not expect that if we go to more and more steps, that the results will get more and more better. Yeah, yeah. That's a very nice systematic work you're doing. Um, so I see no more questions of any kind right now. Nobody wants to say something without hands. No. In, in that case, uh, first of all, thank you, Marita. And then thank to everybody uh, in this session that I had and to everybody that's been talking in this, at this conference, which has been very interesting to me. So. Um, that means that I would leave now the final word to uh, Per Delsing. Please go ahead, Per. Okay, so first I want to say that uh, what I'm going to say is not going to take 20 minutes. It's going to take more like one minute. Uh, I want to thank all of the speakers in the, in the workshop uh, for giving very nice talks. Uh, I think it's been a very nice workshop with many interesting talks, and it's uh, it's a been a, a very nice uh, overview of the status of, of the field. Uh, so I think uh, it's been a very successful workshop. And so uh, thank you all for, for uh, giving talks and, and, and for listening in. Before we end, I also want to uh, say uh, one more thing. So um, if you're interested in what we do in, in VACT, I do encourage you to, to visit our, our uh, homepage, which you, you see here, uh, vakt.se, SE for Sweden. Uh, and I wanna emphasize that we are, we are hiring uh, in, in the era of quantum computing and quantum technology in general. Uh, and at the moment we have uh, quite a few positions open. So if you go in here under work with us, uh, you will find those, um, uh, those uh, announced positions. So with that, I, I'm going to leave this up here if you want to uh, have a look. Uh, so with this, I, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining this workshop. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>